taxes and feed children. Since revenue from taxes relied heavily on migrant labor, and since alternative options for credit were few, many were forced upon children. Scholars have noted the particularly ruthless method, methods of tax collection, and this made the widow Luanda's story of how her daughter, Adewa, was taken from her particularly convincing. Now, I apologize for my atrocious use of PowerPoint. This is not a good example of how to use PowerPoint, um, but given the subject nature of this archive, it's difficult not to. Um, in her testimony here, Luanda blamed the forceful taking and sale of her daughter on the French system of direct rule, but particularly her inability as a sickly widow to pay flanco, the direct tax compulsory in French West Africa. Luanda's testimony highlights the impact of these pressures on children and points to what Gareth Austin has termed in his own work on pawning and cocoa production as the feminization of pawning. Given women's, women and children's lack of access to land and productive and reproductive value, female children were especially in danger of being pawned at this time. This phenomenon was so pronounced in certain areas of French West Africa that Martin Klein and Richard Roberts have shown using missionary archives that administrators encouraged chiefs to uh, actually round up girls from households that could not pay tax and sell them in market at almost sort of a makeshift auction. So the cross-border impact of these, this phenomenon was that in Baku, administrators noted the sale of female children for money in French territory across the border was not at all uncommon. And given the close, close proximity of French Busanga to British Baku in the Northeast, um, this made this cross-border planning particularly attractive as parents could ensure the girls were well looked after and the girls could also flee from ill treatment if need be. The prevalence was so high that one official remarked in 1941 that there were now, quote, many such girls now living in Baku. But the question of how the global depression shaped who had the authority to pawn whom, in this case, is particularly important. Since pawnship was tied to kinship, the pawns were not always kin. Kwaku Nin's testimony is important here because it capitalizes on transformations underway at this difficult time. And he attempts to position himself as an innocent cola trader from Asante, who, like the widow Luanda, was manipulated by the chief of Zatugu. And just as a side note, cola actually here is a stimulant that is very popular in the interior of West Africa, and with the expansion of Islam in the 19th century, it became more popular because it's an alternative to stimulants that are prohibited in Islam, such as alcohol. So this is the first excerpt from what is a very lengthy <laughs> um, original excerpt from Kwakwanen's testimony. I had to be very selective here, and I apologize. Kwakwanen testified he had paid for the girls, but he explained the payment by claiming that the chief had given the girls to him as wives. The money exchange was impartial bride wealth. He goes to great effort to explain that the transaction was in cash rather than livestock, which is what would traditionally be what would be given as bride wealth, because being an Asante man, he did not possess cows and was not aware of Busanga customs. The marriage element of Anin's testimony is not difficult to believe because marriages between creditors and pawns were not all that uncommon, especially if a creditor felt that he would not be able to recover his loan. Marriage seemed uh, a way to capitalize on that investment. But the problem had more to do with his feigned ignorance, the transformations in bride wealth arrangements happening at this time. With the cash economy, bride wealth was becoming more liquid, and as young male laborers returned to the north, they brought with them cash which allowed them to negotiate their own marriage arrangements and transgress gerontocratic structures. As a cola trader working these north-south trade routes, it is difficult to believe in his claim that he was ignorant to these changes. This is the most writing, I promise. Here, Anin describes how he acquired the other two girls, Agnofo and Kubaru, and he goes to pains to list the gifts he brings with him to the chief. This is also an important element of his marriage story, as gifts were an attempt to illustrate the financial obligations of a prospective husband, since prospective husbands were expected to compensate the bride's family, often through labor, presents, and cash payments, and this would be in, in addition to the bridal as well. But despite his claims, it is likely in the news marriage as a mask for pawning, and as Philippe Abafi has noted pawning cases in Benin, to avoid punishment under the ordinance there, both parties to the transaction would agree to tell the same bridal story of denial. This worked particularly well in instances where there existed no written documentation of the transaction, such as in this case. But here also, Anin was given an extra advantage because the chief had just recently passed away, so he could not also give testimony. 
The magistrate's final report gives a sense that he knew the bride price story wasn't legitimate. The problem is he had no way to disprove it. So to these ends, he tried to bring in a character witness, a Busenga farmer from Baku, to act as a, a sort of native informant on Busenga customs. <coughs> Here, the Basenga witness affirmed that it was not the custom for chiefs to give girls away in marriage, and therefore let alone sell them. But what became clear at the close of these testimonies was that a, power, a powerful narrative of chiefly corruption was beginning to develop, and this narrative worked to eclipse Anin's culpability. Traces of chiefly corruption were present in the testimonies of Luanda, Anin, and the Baku farmer. And this narrative struck a chord with the magistrate as it played upon officials often static ideas of tribal taxonomy, taxonomies, marriage payments, and bride wealth, and reaffirmed northern officials' suspicions of chiefly corruption and accumulation within indirect rule. And these um, examples of chiefly corruption and accumulation kind of work towards the eventual um, abandonment of indirect rule in northern territories in the 1940s. Magistrate Amory believed the narrative, and in his concluding remarks, he placed blame squarely on the shoulders of the deceased chief, noting that it was the chief of Zatugu who had, quote, caused these three girls, who were then mere babies, to be torn from their mother's side, without regard to their ultimate fate, selling them into a country where, for all he knew, they might become victims of human sacrifice. His mention of human sacrifice here is important, as it refers to pre-colonial modes of tribute and slaves from northern polities to Asante, and points to the preoccupation of colonial courts with using treatment to discern cases of slavery from those of pawning. What became important then was what the girls had to say about their ill treatment while in Nkazi. Of all the girls, the testimony of Ottawa, whose mother was Luanda the widow, went the furthest to argue her situation as akin to domestic slavery without actually coming out and saying it. She demonstrated this through her testimony's emphasis on facial scarification, otherwise termed in colonial parlance as tribal marks, and I discuss this in other parts of my, my broader thesis. And Adewa explained in her testimony it was these tribal marks that led to her ill treatment as a foreigner. Adewa's reference to tribal marks here points to slavery in pre-colonial Santi, where tribal markings distinguish those who were free from those who were unfree, and slaves of northern origin. As Raymond E. Dummett has noted, there's a common term in Twi, and actually Twi is a language that's found further south from Asante, but um, it's called Lombo, <coughs> and this term was widely used, Dummett says, in the 19th century to refer um, to those persons taken from northern polities who were captured in warfare, purchased on the market as slaves. And its earliest connotation, it simply meant foreigner, and a foreigner from the north who had tribal marks. The teasing Ottawa's ex experience while in Nkazi indicates the extent to which northern workers were still considered donko even in the 1930s. While Ottawa's testimony that she had been ill-treated and teased helped in her redemption, her testimony argues she remained a foreigner while in Asante and thus remained tied to her original Busenga lineage. Unlike slaves, pawns were considered to remain a member of their original lineage and could not be redeemed at any time. Oh, sorry, and could be redeemed at any time. This is further substantiated by her mother, Luanda, who first made her claim for her daughter at the police station after having not seen her for 10 years. Quote, because of the marks on her face and on her stomach, I put when she was a baby. I called her Ottawa. She had no other name. So unlike those girls who were part of cross-border fawning to Baku, who, who could flee their creditors if they endured ill treatment, due to the sheer distance, these girls could not. Crucial to this as well was the fact that the pawns were not only considered to remain a member of their own lineage, but also that pawns often kept their own names. The problem here was that while living in Asante, all three girls had taken on a pawn surnames and common names, which signals less a position of pawnship than that of a domestic slave. And their aliases are, are noted in, uh, prior to their testimony throughout the whole transcript, which is very interesting. What makes this renaming difficult is that it implies a particular subjectivity or state of belonging. The girls' altered names point to a fuller integration into Asante society structure and quite possibly a status that was more domestic slave than pawn. Added to this was a necessity for court translators. After a decade, all three admitted that they did not know the Busenga language anymore, and Adawa and Kubaru chose a Khan to give their testimonies while Avnofo chose to speak in Twi. It is impossible to suggest that the girls could not relate to both Busenga and Asante identities interchangeably. And though Ottawa clearly demonstrates her desire to return to her mother's guardianship, 
the redemption of Abnofo and Kthadu to their male kin proved more complex. Since their parents were deceased, the magistrate put the court proceedings on pause and postponed the final judgment until the police had successfully found Kthadu and Abnofo's parents. In this case, male next of kin who would then become guardians over the girls. This wasn't necessarily that unorthodox as parentage in African studies doesn't necessarily denote biological mother or father, but in the context of this case, it's quite important. Um, in Abnofo's case, they found a male next of kin, Kongsaranga, Kons who was found, and Kibato's case, Lali Kusanga. Um, I can't go into their testimonies for lack of time today, but they're quite interesting as well, as they sort of claim that they don't really recognize the girls and that they're not terribly sure. I think she's my cousin. So there's a lot of, it's, it's quite vague here too. Um, the search for the parents positioned the girls as helpless victims in need of guardians. But crucially, it was also a placing the girls back under male lineage control. And this is interesting because in Marsha Wright's work um, on 19th century Central Africa, and she's looking at um, female pawns and how officials try to uh, reassert or put them back into their male lineage structure. And this was, she argues, uh, an effort to restructure lineage, lineage um, <coughs> structures that were destructured with merchant capital, if that makes sense. Um, so seeing as how Baku was a hub for trade and was home to what officials called a large heterogeneous floating population, Wright's work provides an argument for further exploration and comparison when we're talking about um, redemption and lineage structures in this context. Only Kubadu, alias Ama, attempted to transgress the system. In her testimony, Kubadu made a clever case against his effort to return her back to lineage control. Rather than return to her cousin Lali, who had come forth to claim her, she preferred to continue to follow Faku, and whom she asserted was her husband. And this is her testimony in full. I have not contextualized that or recontextualized that. In asserting her right to follow Faku, Kabato voiced her desire to break free from indigenous and colonial male networks, which often function within indirect rule structures to control young women. Kabato exhibited no hesitation in laying claim to her identity as both Busanga and a quote, Baku girl. But at the same time, she was also clear in her statement that she herself referred Nkanzi to Baku and wished to stay there with the defendant, her husband. At the conclusion of the trial, her plea moved so convincing that the magistrate made a note of it to the chief commissioner stating that he would not be surprised if Kubadu would probably go on to marry Kwaku. Despite Emery's personal belief in Kubadu's claim, she was formally ordered to return to her cousin Lali. The rejection of Kubadu's request illustrates the limits which women's voices can influence decisions in colonial courts. Emery's belief that Kubadu would nevertheless follow Kwaku demonstrates that what was reported on paper counted more than social reality. But her testimony nevertheless challenges colonial perceptions that freedom for women was about re reuniting them with kin or close friends in their cultural homeland. To briefly conclude, at the close of the trial, Kwaku Nin was found guilty of slave dealing. And despite testimonies that supported the charge the three girls were in fact outright sold, the magistrate hesitated on declaring them full slaves. As Amory explained to the chief commissioner, quote, I have no doubt in my mind that these girls were slaves. I say sla slaves in inverted commas advisedly, for the accepted meaning of slave, with all the harshness and cruelty it implies, could not be applied to the treatment of these girls. The final judgment is an example of how, despite the incredible presence of women in slave systems, colony officials often exempted female servitude from that of slavery, perceived slavery as a male institution since women slaves were believed to be more readily absorbed into the household structure. Instead, the magistrate believed Anin regarded the girls as a long-term investment, with the notion to, quote, dispose of them as surety for a never-to-be-repaid loan to someone in Ashanti for some substantial sum. So you see the difficulties here in discerning this between slave dealing and pawning and what was actually happening here, what was intended to happen. But the accuracy of Emery's judgment here is rather less important than what the case can tell us about children and children as agents in migration. Cases like Kwak Manin versus COP would make us think about childhood, should make us think about childhood as a historical problem. And at the very least, move us away from conflating categories of child and youth and associating involuntary child migration with victimhood. The girl's testimonies, especially that of Kibadu, who testified of her desire to follow Kwaku, complicate binaries of agent and victim. And this paper argues that even in context of pawning, Female children and youth cannot be framed as passive victims in African histories. 
Casey Harrell, who I'll introduce now. He's a third year PhD student in the department. Um, he's working with professors Tim Smith and Jackie Duffin. And uh, I don't believe she's using PowerPoint. Uh, her presentation, however, is entitled, One Should Neither Deride It Nor Pin Any Great Hope on It, Medical Responses to Atomic Energy and Crises, 1945 to 1970. I, like Jess, would like to thank the department and the organizing committee of this panel for um, giving me the opportunity to speak today. I would also like to extend my thanks to Dr. Pande, Hussein, and Chowdhury um, for their participation in this event, and I'm very much looking forward to sharing my research with you. On August 5th and 6th, 1945, two atomic bombs were detonated by the American government over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. Jubilation felt by many at the end of the war was tempered by the recognition that warfare and international relations had been irreversibly altered by the use of such destructive technology. The published response in, August, in autumn of 1946 was one of initial relief that the war in the Pacific appeared to be over, met with a concern about the loss of life and the appalling reports about the death and destruction caused by the bomb. With the use of the bomb, the world had been ushered into what was termed the atomic age. Societal fascination with the destructive possibility of weaponized nuclear energy was matched in medicine by the sense that harnessing nuclear power could lead to groundbreaking diagnostic tools, treatments, and therapies. Despite its potential for medical research and practice, nuclear physics remained a contentious subject because of prevailing fears about the dangers of radiation poisoning and workplace safety in labs where technologies were being developed. Uncertainty about the future development of the relationship between medical research, clinical practice, and nuclear physics abounded. As one 1946 editorial in The Lancet aptly observed, when it came to the potential benefit of atomic science for medicine, quote, one should neither deride it nor pin any great hope on it. Nonetheless, physicians followed developments in the field with great interest, as indicated by the sheer volume of coverage in high-impact medical journals. This paper examines the published response of medical professionals to developments in nuclear physics before 1970. It considers the intersection of medicine, science, and foreign policy, through the lens of nuclear physics and its use both militarily and for peaceable purposes, a particularly contentious domestic policy issue that was duly influenced by the international networks of scientific experts and materials further complicated by Cold War politics. Moreover, the omnipresent reality that the same technology used to develop life-saving treatments could be weaponized created a set of challenging ethical considerations in an era characterized by highly charged international political maneuvering. My focus today will be largely domestic and emphasizes the British angle of my project just because of time and space. And for the purposes of this work in progress paper, I will focus best largely on a single publication, the British Medical Journal, which over the period of my study published a wide variety of articles, editorials, and reports related to nuclear physics and its many implications for the medical community. I should say that I am by no means a nuclear physicist and that while I have learned a lot about nuclear fission and fusion over the course of this project, um, there is no amount of my reading on the subject that will give me enough knowledge to overcome a truly abysmal showing in grade 11 physics. And so, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, I came to this particular aspect of my research with little more than a cursory knowledge of the difference between fission and fusion and basically no understanding of how reactors work, let alone how they're applicable to medical research. In this way, I was actually in much the same position as the very physicians that I'm studying because they too seem completely blind to the way that these things work. Um, they were first and foremost clinicians with an interest in the health of their patients and how that health was going to be affected by these weapons. This paper is derived from a chapter that I'm working on dealing with the published response of physicians to atomic energy and to nuclear physics more generally, dealing with the period after the detonation of the atomic bomb in 1945, as I said, up until 1970. And I would like to suggest, above all else, that as a profession, physicians present a particularly interesting window into the psychological and, psychological and strategic space occupied by nuclear technology in the early Cold War. More broadly, it should be said that my dissertation explores the position of physicians and public health workers as international actors in the post-war world, and the related processes by which health and medicine were articulated as foreign policy interests. I am researching the position of Canadian, British, and American medical professionals as internationalists and what I call inadvertent diplomats in the early Cold War, and I explore the ways in which networks of medico-scientific expertise were put in service of broader foreign policy goals in that period. 
methodologically and trying to weave together a more traditional history of institutional formation with things like the WHO and the World Medical Association with more recent work on the global history of, me of medicine and the importance of networks to that history. This method builds upon the work of scholars who have examined how networks of scientific experts and other knowledge elites were able to influence the policies and priorities of international organization and therefore of governments. To get back to my actual paper for today, <laughs> debates about the appropriate use of nuclear technology and exchange of ideas about atomic weapons, along with the international distribution of radioactive isotopes, fit into my larger research interests more seem rather seamlessly. The articles, editorials, and published correspondence about a single issue, nuclear physics and medicine, demonstrate the intersection of post-war interest in technological innovation and the expansion of what's called scientific medicine, with Cold War anxieties both born and domestic, and the way that these factors were mediated through international networks of scientific expertise. My survey of the medical journals between 1945 and 1970 has revealed three main points that I would like to expand upon today. First, the extent to which opinion about nuclear physics evolved over time. Second, the permeation of a decidedly pacifist foreign policy angle outlook. And third, the optimism with which physicians viewed the peaceable use of nuclear technology and radioactive isotopes in clinical practice. The interaction of these final two factors, I think, demonstrates the complex relationship that the medical profession had with nuclear technology. It was at once horrified by the disruptive capacity of these weapons but also dependent on radioactive materials produced through the very same research in order to sort of fuel their expanding research interest in the human body and understanding various diseases. And I don't think it's any surprise that the rise of this atomic age saw the importance of radioactive isotopes in diagnostics and in clinical practice expand enormously. Historiographically, this work fits with a plethora of monographs and articles about the history of nuclear physics and the popular response to the bomb and to the atomic age itself. That said, scholars have largely neglected the position of physicians in the period before the establishment of advo advocacy organizations like Physicians for Social Responsibility and the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which actually goes past where my project ends. And they focused instead, understandably perhaps, on the physicists that were involved in the production of these nuclear technologies. But my suggestion to you is that physicians have an important um, sort of perspective to speak to in this period because of the difficult position in which they found themselves given their relationship with isotopes and fears about um, the death and destruction that could be caused by a bomb. My work also draws on the ways in which science and technology contributed to a transformation of the world order after the Second World War, based on the expanding presence of scientific and technical experts in diplomatic affairs. Physicians, especially those involved in the distribution and use of radioactive materials in research and clinical practice, were a part of these networks though their presence, as I said, has been largely overlooked by scholars in lieu of these physicists. From the outset, the atomic bomb had a great deal of linguistic currency in contemporary discourse. The medical community grappled with the implications of the bomb in the same way that any other professional or lay group would have, but they had the added complication of having been what they saw as scientifically complacent in the creating the bomb in the first place. Physicians envisioned themselves as part of this larger scientific brotherhood and thus saw themselves as being caught between the proverbial rock and a hard place because they were bound by the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. The initial response to the bomb reflected this tension most eloquently through the news, disease, and destruction reports out of Japan in the aftermath. In time, fears about all-out nuclear war abated and concern over the dangers of radiation poisoning shifted to concern about occupational health hazards for workers at nuclear test facilities and the potential hazard of atmospheric, ground, and water radiation poisoning from weapons tests and nuclear accidents. I think, as I said, that one of the most fascinating aspects of my research has been my realization that the physicians that I'm looking at have very, not much more understanding of these processes than I do. And letters to the editor of medical, letters to the editor of medical journals demonstrated a clear interest in atomic technology and the way that medical practitioners could benefit from this research particularly as it pertains to the way that radioactive isotopes can be used in diagnostic treatment. But frequent, frequent reference was made to the fact that most of the people that were reading these journals had no base understanding of the kinds of technology that were being talked about in specialist articles, and so the journals had a responsibility to their readership to inform them and to sort of keep them abreast of the way that changes were going on in the field. Relatedly, in, the, in conjunction with the establishment of new nuclear reactors, like that at Harwell, UK, which became Europe's first nuclear reactor in 1946, 
interest in peaceable uses of nuclear energy spiked. These spikes were reflected in coverage in medical journals and were characterized by a sense of optimism about the potential clinical and diagnostic benefit of using radioactive materials safely and effectively. While radioactive materials had been an aspect of clinical diagnosis and treatment since far before the Second World War, the atomic age ushered in a new flurry of interest in their use, especially as their efficacy was further proven and they were deemed safe for a wider array of diagnostic tests. Moreover, the improved availability of these materials with the construction of new reactors and nuclear piles ensured that they were more readily accessible to smaller hospitals, which would greatly expand their use as well. I think that the distribution of isotopes de demonstrates the international character of scientific exchange surrounding nuclear technology, because after March 1948, Harwell, distribu Harwell was distributing hundreds of specimens of radioactive isotopes across Britain and around the world, and it was not the largest of the reactors that I'm considering. Um, hospitals and medical research labs around the world came to rely heavily on isotopes for a variety of medical applications, and the individuals and organizations who were connected via distribution networks for these isotopes formed a particular branch of these medico-scientific networks that I'm considering. Their involvement in nuclear physics research, even inadvertently, and all of the militarization and potential dangers of the technology entailed, was met with a scientific interest in using the same technology to look at the human body in new ways and to discover new treatments for old disease foes. Cold War anxieties about the nuclear arms race and the accompanying fears about possession of weapons technology by governments on the other side of the Iron Curtain were actually largely absent from this aspect of the discussion. The danger of nuclear weapons was articulated as a danger to humanity in general, rather than a paranoid sort of fear about the bomb of the enemy. Medical professionals discussing these networks of expertise in nuclear technology were wary of sharing their knowledge and their isotopes with people on the wrong side of the curtain. But there was a prevailing mood of scientific cooperation that characterized the tone and content of the articles over the entire timeline that I have surveyed. Over the course of the period surveyed for this paper, the atomic age pervaded medicine as radioisotopes and their use in treatment and diagnostics increased. Artificial radioactivity had actually been discovered in 1934 by Ian and Frédéric Chaudiot-Curie, and nuclear medicine gained ground in 1946 when an article was published about the successful treatment of a patient with thyroid cancer using radioiodine. Widespread use of nuclear medicine clinically began in the early 1950s as knowledge expanded about radionuclides, the detection of radioactivity, and using certain of these radionuclides to trace biochemical processes. By 1948, as I said, Harwell was producing enough radioisotopes that almost every issue of the British Medical Journal included news clippings about contacts and contracts for the supply of radioisotopes and tracers and equipment along with the regulation of these materials. The inclusion of such detailed information about shipments and access procedures shows, I think, contemporary interest in all things atomic and the degree to which nuclear medicine had captured the attention of non-specialist physicians. In 1948, the first British treat first British patients were treated with radioactive isotopes and the British Nuclear Medicine Society was organized by 1966, thereby solidifying the professional legitimacy of this branch of medicine. Another way that the discussion about nuclear physics permeated contemporary medical journals was in discussions about the danger of radioactive fallout from nuclear reactors and facilities that were producing these isotopes for peaceable purposes, but also were engaged in trying to come up with the, enough plutonium to create what was called the first British bomb and they talk about it in like big all caps all the time, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, I think that the most telling example of fears about this fallout um, followed the Windscale Fire, which began on the 10th of October 1957 and continued for three days following that. It was, to date, the worst nuclear accident in British history and occurred when the core of the Unit 1 reactor, which had been made operational in October 1950, caught fire, releasing significant amounts of radioactive contamination into the surrounding area which then spread across the UK and Europe. Notably, Windscale had been rushed into operation in order to demonstrate British technological equivalency with the United States so that nuclear weapons treaties could be worked out. The intention was for the facility to produce plutonium for the first British bomb. And here again, we see the sort of conflation of an interest in the weaponized version of this technology and the way that medical professionals relied upon these isotopes. And their coverage of the Windscale incident very heavily reflects their fears about the dangers of radioactive contamination, but also their sense that the weaponization of this technology is leading to only the bad side of the equation. A series of articles and reports from about 1957 until 1960, when interest in the incident sort of died down, 
revealed the degree to which the UK Atomic Energy Authority had failed in its responsibility to monitor levels of radioactive material in the soil and vegetation. Because until the accident, there actually hadn't been any systemic monitoring of the levels of strontium-90, which is the main dangerous sort of radioactive element that can make its way into the air. Um, but there hadn't been any monitoring of this. There had been some of the radioactive iodine, but that is not nearly as dangerous to humans as any of these other byproducts. The, the dangers of strontium were first actually noticed in 1955 when fuel elements overheating. Again, it sounds like this was a very shoddily built nuclear facility. You don't hear about these dangers with very many of the other ones, but it seems that wind scale was particularly bad. But in 1955, they had noticed that there was radioactive iodine making its way into the grass supply being used by cows. And so they were finding these levels of iodine and strontium in milk. And so they actually shut down the distribution of milk from the farms nearby this area of the UK. But the BMJ was quick to point out that the most dangerous, if dangerous isotopes like strontium-90 had been distributed from the fire in the way that iodine had been, that they would have had to like shut down the entire plant, but because it hadn't been, there was a sort of, basically there was a sense of confusion, which I think reflects the fact that the UK Atomic Energy Agency was not doing its due diligence. Um, and doctors, again, found themselves caught between needing the isotopes and also wanting to kind of tamper the scientific messing around that was occurring. At the beginning of my timeline, radioisotopes and their benefit to medicine was often discussed alongside other forms of nuclear technology, including weapons and energy. As the medical profession came to take a harder line on society's acceptance of nuclear weapons and the arms race, the articles dealing with radioactive materials and their use in clinical practice were gradually sort of separated from this larger overarching discussion. Moreover, the number of articles pertaining to the occupational hazard of working in nuclear facilities and case studies about radioactive poisoning and other incidents of fallout demonstrate the evolution of societal and medical thought on nuclear facilities and testing. And so we go from having these sort of holistic visions of what nuclear energy and what nuclear technology means for society to physicians sort of realizing that they can't have it both ways, that they don't want to have it both ways, and that they're going to support wholeheartedly radioisotopes but gradually develop a more sort of peace-loving attitude towards the technology in general. Once nuclear energy was ingrained as a reality of life in the post-war period, the tone and content of medical journal coverage of these issues understandably went from surprise and shock to acceptance and excitement about the clinical and tactical benefit of nuclear technology to a wariness then about the pitfalls of relying on such a toxic and dangerous substance for your energy needs, for your weapons needs, and for your medical needs. Ultimately, there developed a clear distinction between peaceable uses of nuclear te technology and its weaponization. Physicians and allied medical professionals gradually developed a more nuanced understanding of the so-called atomic age, and through the support more fully behind nuclear medicine, at the same time that other groups of physicians organized opposition to nuclear weapons. Physicians have a long history of involvement in international causes and in humanitarian work in both war and peacetime. By far the most significant aspect of the physician's perspective on nuclear weapons, for the purposes of this paper and for my research in general, were the ways in which pacifism and humanitarian internationalism infiltrated the coverage of nuclear technology and radioactive materials in medical journals. Ultimately, weaponized nuclear technology presented a new cause to rally against in light of its destructive capabilities. By 1951, a group of 130 British doctors created the Physicians' Peace Movement, known as the Medical Association for the Prevention of War. These physicians advocated for disarmament and an end to nuclear testing as a mode of preventive medicine. By the 1960s, an American equivalent developed when a group of physicians studied and documented the blast, heat, and radiation effects of nuclear weapons and came to what they saw as the inescapable conclusion that a meaningful medical response to nuclear war was impossible. These physicians went on to form the organization Physicians for Social Responsibility, which exists to this day. And in 1961, PSR published articles in the New England Journal of Medicine that influenced American understanding of thermonuclear war for that, from that point forward. These were the first comprehensive analysis by physicians and medical scientists of the, of the potential ramifications of a nuclear attack on the continental United States. Abolition of nuclear weapons, they argued, was the best and only form of preventative medicine where nuclear weapons were concerned. I think that the most beautifully elucidated example of this perspective in the British medical press was a series of correspondence entitled Atomic Weapons and the Medical Profession, which was published in the BMJ in March and April 1950, which you'll notice actually predates the formation of the British organization like PSR. The initial writer, W.B. Cruden, remarked that until Hiroshima and Nagasaki, weapons were designed to destroy military targets and to kill combatants. After 1946, however, a new and outrageous situation was afoot. 
he asked, quote, should this greatest threat to human life evoke no reaction from the medical profession, our sole raison d'etre as doctors is the helping and saving of life, and it is surely our duty to do what we can to prevent disaster from overtaking the human race. Doctors all over the world united against the menace of, bac of bacteria. Should they sh surely they should unite against the menace of this super pathogen. I suggest that leaders of the medical profession issue a solemn manifesto condemning the use of atomic weapons and, in the name of humanity, urging their abolition. This initial article received a flurry <coughs> of correspondence in response. Um, and it reveals, I think, that many physicians thought that science had to be reined in if it was going to peacefully coexist with nuclear weapons. There was an accompanying realization that so much scientific research funding was being allocated for nuclear weapons testing and that very little was being used for medical research in general, let alone medical research into the ways that you could sort of offset the dangers of the weapons themselves. In this way, I think that physicians were able to separate themselves from scientists who were involved in, wider nuclear, in the wider nuclear project. And they were able to articulate their professional position as defenders of human life, rather than complacent accomplices in its destruction. Because they saw themselves not as just scientists for the sake of science anymore, but instead as scientists who were actively involved in trying to protect people from what the other scientists were doing. And they're very clearly developed a sort of us versus them mentality and tone in the articles around this period. That ebbs and flows, of course, but that is, there's definitely a sea change that occurs. Another responder remarked, quote, it has seemed to me for some time that we as a profession have been deliberately turning fearfully away from the implications of the atomic age. This is not good enough. We, par excellence, are a humanitarian profession. Yet what barbarism could excel the proposal to use weapons which can wipe out 100,000 or more at one stroke? He continued, what nonsense the current experiments in bacteriological warfare make of the work and lives of the great bacteriologists. Is the Hippocratic tradition to end in some super elaboration of the Nazi extermination sanatoria or in the technique of artificially spreading plague as used by the Japanese? I feel, sir, that, they can be, that there can be no justification, neither military nor social nor ideological, for the use of mass extermination weapons, which even from a military point of view are self-stultifying. This condemnation of nuclear weapons and continued research into them certainly employ rhetorical language to make its point, but I think that it nonetheless illuminates the professional turn away from a sort of blithe acceptance of nuclear technology and of contemporary geopolitics, and instead a turn towards a more sort of peaceful outlook and a, an optimism about the use of radioisotopes, but a move away from weapons. Another reply to Cruden's letter replaced the responsibility of condemning the use of atomic weapons squarely on the shoulders of medical professionals. The writer remarked, as years pass by and my experience of the world, and, and in particular my knowledge of my fellow practitioner deepens, I have become increasingly amazed at the ease with which doctors can put important background factors of illness out of their minds. But I also grow dismayed with the utter defeatism of those doctors who, in fact, try to consider the effects of the environment on the health of the patient and yet see no way to affect or improve it. How, do, how divorced from reality it is to quietly go about our work of curing and preventing sickness while plans are rapidly maturing, which, if allowed to develop, will result in the complete destruction not only of our practices, but of the major part of humanity. May Dr. Cruden's suggestions be followed by the rousing of medical and public opinion to such a pitch that the prevention of atomic warfare becomes a reality. This sentiment would be echoed in editorial comments and other exchanges of correspondence later on, as the medical profession came to distance its interest in nuclear medicine more clearly from the weaponized aspects of the atomic age. Ultimately, my survey of the medical literature demonstrates that while physicians understood themselves to be scientists in some respects, they placed medicine and the protection of human life on a higher plane because of their perception of the inherent humanitarianism of their profession. I think that this paper also speaks to the tension between domestic and international factors involved in nuclear technology. You have this reactors versus weapons sort of tension that occurs. There's an, there's an issue of practical prevention of nuclear meltdown a, that runs alongside the sort of idealistic t sense that you need to curtail nuclear technology more generally. And I think that at the end of the day, this entire case study of nuclear technology for me and for my broader work shows the way that a lot of these factors come into contact and intersect with each other in a very fairly neat and tidy case study compared to some of the other things that I'm looking at. The historiography of nuclear technology after the Second World War has placed physicists squarely at the center of this storm and has largely pushed, pushed physicians and nuclear medicine to the side. I hope that my research sheds additional light on the complexity of the nuclear project in the early Cold War. 
particularly as it pertains to the position of physicians who struggled with questions about the morality of weapons of mass destruction and how medicine could respond to crises that would be wrought by nuclear war. And above all else, how they could reconcile their duty to oppose the weaponization of technology that had a demonstrated clinic and diagnostic value. Thank you. Well, thanks very much to you, Casey, and just for terrific and rich presentations. To kick off and inaugurate our discussion, I'll invite Dr. Ishika Pande to offer a response. Um, let me begin by saying what a great pleasure it is to comment on these two papers. Uh, both uh, Jess and Casey, I first met them when they came here as we MA students. <laughs> and it is wonderful to see how their work has developed in the meantime and um, you guys are ready to fly. Both, both of you managed to speak across traditional field boundaries, both geographically as well as conceptually. Um, so uh, Casey's paper, as you just heard, is focused on medicine and internationalism and humanitarianism, uh, intrinsically sort of subjects of global implication. Uh, and she has pursued her source, the British Medical Journal, to tease out a story about the um, ambiguous commitment to humanitarianism uh, that emerged as physicians strug struggle to reconcile their opposition to the weaponization of the technology while embracing its clinical and diagnostic value. Uh, Casey crosses the history of science and medicine uh, with that of Cold War politics and humanitarian internationalism, uh, while Jessica speaks to historians interested in the history of colonial law, of childhood and gender, uh, well across the northeastern borders of Ghana, uh, where the, uh, the court case that she talked about today about the pawning of three girls, uh, which was at the heart of the story, uh, was located. So to my mind, the two papers offer a very rich introduction to the diversity, the high quality, and the topicality of the projects that are being undertaken by so many of our graduate students in this program. So uh, again, uh, I can't do justice to the wealth of details that uh, you've left us to ponder over, so I'll just limit myself to a couple of comments and questions before opening up the discussion, right? So in Jessica's paper, we have several discrete strands of inquiry opening up from a single court case. First, with her history of child pawning, she seeks to question the binaries of agent and victim. And I think this is not just a, you know, very interesting and appropriate for the history of childhood, uh, but also to think about colonialism in general to sort of disrupt this binary. Um, so, uh, through a close scrutiny of a unique court case involving um, in, in colonial West Africa, Jessica raises questions that have continued to rage amongst historians of childhood in particular. How are testimonies of children to be read, and how might we historicize the very idea of childhood, especially in the law? So a question related to this that I have is, uh, what was the st status of the testimony being offered by uh, these girls who were being viewed as children, I'm assuming? Uh, so in my own research on colonial law in India, for instance, I found that children were more likely to be, be, to be believed than women when it came to uh, testifying in cases of uh, sexual violence, for example, and less likely to be believed if they were claiming uh, agency as, um, as these girls did, that you know, I'm following Waku and I'm married to him. So uh, what was the state, how, how did age uh, fit in to sort of court plea procedures and in the law, and that's something maybe you want to reflect on a little bit. Um, and what was the juridical logic that it, you know, ultimately allowed um, uh, uh, the voice of this this girl, what, what was her name again? Kabaka or Emma. To be ignored. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so in another strand of this rich story, Jessica has demonstrated the ways in which uh, the political economy of pawning was transformed with the commercialization of indigenous inst institutions and a burgeoning cash nexus. These transformations also occurred in what might be called the marriage market, uh, which you traced uh, here beautifully, uh, such that the lines between pawning, the sale of girls, and marriage became blurred. Uh, this indeed was the key to Kwaku defense. 
Um, the rest of Jessica's work is likewise a nuanced study of the intimate and gendered effects of changes in the domain of political economy, uh, here captured in the feminization of pawning and the gendering of slavery, which you uh, talked about beautifully today. Uh, third, keeping up with and stepping beyond the scholarship on law in a variety of colonial contexts, uh, uh, Jessica, you've shown how uh, colonial courts were successfully used by African women, uh, as evidenced here um, by the restitution of her daughter to the uh, widow Lu Luanda. Uh, even as the law also served to shore up kinship structures that merchant capital had destabilized. Uh, sometimes this was to the detriment of women, and sometimes, uh, at as it was in the case of the girl Kibadu, uh, against their will. So while these details and the broader story they tell about colonial economy and law are very carefully fleshed out here, I'm also curious to hear a little more of the bigger story that I'm sure exists in your dissertation uh, about the embedded critique of aspects of French administration, uh, of indirect rule, uh, the phenomenon of uh, cross-border pawning, and the use of the Anglo-French border as a way of dodging the law. Okay. So could you tell us a little bit more about the legal landscape and the jurisdictional boundaries that existed here? So I think that would help us, the non-specialists, to understand this rich landscape that you're talking about. So, but, but most importantly, I'm absolutely taken in by your sources. And I'm, I'd love to hear more about how you came across this extremely rich court case. Um, and and that, that would be something uh, that maybe you could talk about. So coming to Casey's paper, uh, she follows a single problem of mighty proportions. Uh, the discussions over nuclear energy between 45 and 70 to write a wide-ranging history at the intersection of the history of science, medicine, and technology on the one hand, and internationalism, humanitarianism, and foreign policy on the other. Uh, so while historians of medicine have been trying to bring together the study of medicine and politics uh, successfully for at least two generations now, Casey's approach seems to me to be absolutely novel in bringing the medical archive to bear on the history of the bomb uh, and to Cold War diplomacy. She's wresting the discussions of nuclear energy away from the history of physicists and war and bringing it to bear on the history of physicians and peace. So uh, Casey mentioned that she was surprised to realize that physicians had little knowledge of nuclear physics. <laughs> <laughs> and I was reading this paper, I thought, well, they might have had little knowledge, but they and you certainly have a lot more knowledge than I do. <laughs> so I was having some trouble following the paper. But this brings me to the question, uh, which is, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the use, the medical uses of this technology at a time when it was uh, you know, still a new technology? Were there any quirky uses? Was there ever any hand-wringing as to should we jettison even the medical uses of this technology because we are so aware of the dangers of it and so on. So in the British Medical Journal, obviously, you've uh, laid out the story of advocacy against the use of, you know, the violent use of this technology, but what was the sort of more medical side of the discussion, if any? Um, and two, I, w I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the physicians themselves who were putting their weight behind nuclear medicine. Uh, is there any way to learn of their politics outside of this work they were doing? Uh, do we know what their you know, political leanings were otherwise? Uh, was there any relationship, if any, and of what type between the various bodies that came up in Canada and Britain um, and the US? And did these bodies intervene directly in the field of global diplomacy? So I'm assuming that in the, re in the rest of your work, uh, beyond writing in the British Medical Journal, were they inserting themselves into discussions elsewhere? So finally, because I like sort of tensions in stories, as you know, uh, so I'm wondering if um, it might be interesting to look at similar sources from the other side of the curtain, as it were. And are you planning on doing that? And at the end of the paper, you mentioned that while physicians understood themselves to be scientists, they played medicine, um, they placed medicine and the protection of human life on a higher plane because of their per perception of the inherent humanitarianism of their profession, which makes me wonder if there was any place for dissent within the medical profession. Or was there a clear consensus 
And was there a great confidence um, that the good and the bad uses of nuclear energy could be completely separated from each other? Uh, so basically, I'm asking you one big question in a long-winded way, and maybe you could tell us a little bit more about where this piece fits into the larger puzzle, because I realize you've decided to focus on the British Medical Journal for the purpose of this paper. So what's the larger canvas in which these physicians are inserting themselves? So I think I'll leave it there and open up the floor. Please. Great. I think maybe it would be useful to have you both come up and perhaps briefly address the questions. Um, that Dr. Pandey has posed and then open it up to wider reactions and questions. So I'd like to come up. Um, thank you, Professor Pandey. Those are some really um, incisive comments and some really good questions to think about. And um, I am especially appreciative of your patience with me in this new sort of um, entry into children because this is not something I started out looking at and it basically just sort of came out of this case which um, and you asked how I sort of came upon it but I sort of stumbled upon it when I was in Tamil in the archives because when I first started out my research I had an idea of, of what I wanted to look at and, and the project has evolved so much from there I ended up looking at anything that, found, that I found interesting um, that was pertaining to women and children or, or anything along with that, that matter in terms of tribal markings and, and these types of things. And so that's when I came across it and actually it was buried in my, um, in my stored photos. And when I came back to it much later, I realized only after I'd written a bit that how big this could be and how important it could be to the thesis. So it was kind of a very lucky find in that sense. Um, but to answer your first um, question regarding the status of the children. Um, I'm going to sort of club that together with your comments on um, African women's sort of use of colonial courts because I really think that um, Ottawa's testimony worked with her mothers and she was the youngest of the three girls um, and the way in which they employed, uh, they employed a certain language in terms of um, Kendra Matongi has talked about this in, in Kenya and East Africa. She's talked about how women have, widows specifically, have looked, used colonial courts the sort of way to um, to sort of foster empathy among males. So turning around that sort of gender dynamic of paternalism and using that to their own ends of, if that makes sense at all, um, in terms of actually these types of rival cases. So I mean, you see a little bit, and I, I kind of flesh this out a bit more in my longer chapter, um, that Luanda's doing this. And then Ottawa, her language that she uses too, is very much about, um, I mean, you do feel sorry for her, I mean, the way she's being teased, especially with a magistrate who has these certain conceptions of slavery, and um, slavery always being a very big part of how administrators saw that they wanted to develop um, West Africa, to sort of, um, at least the Northern Territories, put it back on the lines that it should have followed prior to the disruption of the Atlantic slave trade. And so slavery is always factoring into these sort of, these sort of cases. Um, in Kabato's sense that she's exerting the agency and you're saying that usually this is where the buck stops is when, um, is when children try to exert agency in a sense. What I would say about that is I find it interesting because it's, it's layered um, or embedded, I should say, within the fact that these girls are coming to the age of initiation. They're coming to the age in which um, they can and will be married and therefore they're, even, they're especially valuable, more valuable even, well, arguably than when they were young, right, at this particular moment. And what I couldn't really um, describe more, but was in the testimony here that Anin gives, is that the chief said when he gave away Ottawa, um, you cannot sleep with the girls until they're returned back and we have something done to them. And this is, and this is in, in terms of what I've looked at, in terms of Busanga females in my earlier chapter, this is female circumcision. And so this is being brought up in the archive, the transcript, does not factor into the magistrate's final decision. And this is part, and I'll segue into the other comment that you made, of the larger dissertation that I'm working on, which is a certain sort of um, attitude towards a gradualness. And this comes up in other work um, that has been done in West Africa in terms of slavery, um, that there was a gradualness to it dying out. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking at um, not just female circumcision and cases such as this where there's pawning or you know, um, generally unfree labor, um, but also nudity, 
and um, cases of um, you know child trafficking and these types of things and basically an attitude that is we do not want to fully legislate against this we do not want to um, intervene in this way um, we want this to gradually die out and so that's a theme that is threaded um, through all of what I call undesirable practices um, uh, in this particular area of West Africa so uh, I'm not too sure if that, if that sort of answered your, your questions at all. But, yeah. I will go. Um, I want to thank you so much for your comments. And you used a phrase about um, studying the history of the bombings in the medical archive that I'm going to try and like incorporate into my own thing. I didn't realize what I was doing until you said what I was doing. And I like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> your first question was about the actual positive medical uses of the technology. And I will profess that my understanding of nuclear medicine is paltry at best. Um, the large proportion of the articles that deal specifically with that aspect of things seem interested in the use of radioactive iodine and radioactive something else that I probably can't pronounce to treat thyroid cancer, um, which is the first application largely of these um, technologies and treatments. And as the time period covered by, my, covered by my study goes on, there are increasing numbers and types of cancer that are, used, that are being um, treated and diagnosed even with these materials. Um, and I think that, again, by the end of the period that I'm looking at, these things are almost commonplace in a lot of hospitals. And it's, we know about radiotherapy, we know about radiation therapy, and this is sort of the birth of that kind of treatment for cancer. And I see that Jackie is sitting over here, so she can, if, she might know something and I'll, yeah, she's, she's giving me a hand wave. But um, you, you mentioned that I, sh I largely showed today the sort of ad advocacy against nuclear technology. But I think that the far larger part of the story, albeit the one that I find a little bit less interesting, mm -hmm. is the positive way in which these things um, were applied in the clinic and by hospitals. And the, the sort of rise of nuclear medicine and the birth of journals of nuclear medicine in this period also, I think, shows the sort of professionalization and the um, entrenchment of this branch of medicine, which is very exciting in, in the scope of my, giant, my more giant project. Um, that actually leads into your second question about the journals and the physicians themselves and what they were up to. Um, it's, I found it dreadfully difficult, to be honest, to sort of trace the people that are writing these letters. I'm finding that maybe some of them are writing under pseudonyms, which is itself an interesting sort of um, thing to contend with. And physicians from this period have, did not necessarily see themselves as people that needed to keep paper records in the way that some physicians of the 19th century would have done. Um, Admittedly, this, uh, this phase of my project has been largely concerned with the published record thus far, but I am interested in getting back into the archive and looking for some of the more sort of um, more frequently published people, because there are names that recur, and to sort of see what their politics were. And you can usually tell based on the articles and the tone that a lot of them tend to be sort of left-leaning um, beyond the fact that they all hate the NHS, but that's a whole other sort of side of the story. Um, and that again leads into your third question of where this fits more broadly into my project and whether there was room for dissent. I think that as opposed to actual dissent in these medical journals, I see, as I said, more of an evolution of thought on the issues. And you see people sort of oscillating back and forth between hating the bomb but needing it, hating the technology but needing it. Um, I'm sure that there are outspoken people who did not agree with what ends up being published in these journals. But when, you, when I see these series of correspondence, they're largely sort of in line with each other, which to me just solidifies, for my own research, the fact that as much as there might have been divided opinion, the prevailing wisdom of the age was that you needed to sort of speak out against these things in case the physicists ran away with the store, basically. But yeah, I hope that sort of addresses where I'm coming from. Thank you. Why don't we open up generally for questions from the floor? Uh, thank you. There are two really excellent things. Uh, my question was for Casey. Um, I was wondering if the, the debate about this, about, ex about using new techniques of radiation treatments and so forth, um, you presented it playing out against the kind of ethical questions of nuclear weaponry and so forth. But was there any sense in the journal that doctors who are sort of presenting themselves as humanitarian profession, um, and that's been touching, of course, all that, but <laughs> Um, were themselves grappling with their own history of uh, experimentation on human subjects, which of course had reached its kind of low point for the Nazi uh, medical profession. So, but did they feel any sort of pressure to sort of consider radiation 
treatments in light of that history. And of course, eugenics and American experiments on African American subjects, so things, scandals of that kind. One of the things that I find particularly lovely and hilarious about doctors from this period is their own sort of sense of self-importance and their complete ability to ignore what has happened even the generation before them. Um, that said, the inclusion of that, there was that phrase about Nazi extermination in the last letter that I quoted from. And so it's very clear that those that do have a more sort of wide-ranging conscience are aware of where their profession has come from. Um, I don't think necessarily that any of the ones that I've looked at or that I have any evidence to suggest that they see radiation therapy as potentially a detriment to human health more generally. Um, but in terms of reconciling sort of where their profession has come from and whether their involvement in nuclear weapons testing and whatnot might potentially present ethical complications, I think that, again, their, their need and their complete professional interest in separating themselves from the physicists Yes, we're all scientists, but we are the humanitarians. They are the ones that are building these bombs. Yeah, we need the stuff that they're making in these radioactive piles, which incidentally, if I had put a picture up there, would have been the only one that I could have showed you. It's a thing that's like this big, and it, it's just shiny and silver, and it's not that exciting, which is why Jess, I guess, had a PowerPoint, and I did not. Um, but yeah, they, they need these things that are coming from these nuclear piles, but they're able somehow to separate themselves from the other sort of implications of these things. Um, but there is not that I've seen any real sense that radiotherapy or radiation used clinically, used for treatment and diagnosis, is, is ever going to have a sort of um, eugenic or Nazi-like effect on the population at large. Tim. Hi. Yeah, a question <clears throat> excuse me, for Casey as well. Um, um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, doctors were mentioned, and, and you know, not only were doctors feeling perhaps rather self-important at this time, but for good measure, right? I mean, they, you know, they're discovering uh, you know, vaccines for polio, and et cetera, et cetera, and they've never been held um, in such high esteem by the general public. I mean, this is really the sort of heyday of, of, of the doctor as, uh, as you, know, you suggest, humanitarian and, and, um, and so forth. I'm just wondering to what extent doctors um, did or did not need to use this newfound standing to reassure the public about, um, about the potential um, um, use of, of, um, of uh, nuclear medicine. I, I'm just wondering if there are any parallels to that with today's distrust of GM food among, among the general population. Um, or, I mean, in other words, what, what does the general um, public feel? Um, and do we know? And uh, to what extent are doctors? In terms of the new form of therapy, I think that this, because doctors have as much um, sort of professional currency, let's say, in society as they do at this time, there's a lot of patients just sort of nodding their heads when they tell them that this is what needs to be done. Yes, we are going to put you under this machine that's going to fry the outside of your body in order to get rid of the cancer that's in your gut. And as much as patients are not stupid in this phase of, of the history of medicine and of the history of treatment and whatnot, I think that there is a lot. There are a lot of patients who simply do whatever the doctor orders, um, and so in that in that sense, I don't think necessarily that doctors feel that they have to justify their actions or their their feelings about nuclear medicine to their patients. But beyond that, and in terms of your parallels of GM foods and whatnot, um, I think that based on the the editorials and the correspondence that I've read, that physicians felt that they should sort of act as beacons for and sort of. Um, spread the gospel, I guess, if you will, of nuclear technology and its peaceable use. Because they're saying, we're not going to do it. Who else is going to? The general population has even less of an understanding of radioisotopes than we do. We should be the ones who are able to go forth and sort of paint a rosy picture, if nothing else, for the population. Um, and the initial response against nuclear weapons technology in the UK actually occurred from within the churches. And there was an editorial that I didn't include in the paper today that basically said, why are we letting the church, which who are not scientists, have this sort of um, have this sort of sway over the population? We as scientists, we as medical scientists, should be the ones going out and sort of informing the population and using our professional position in order to sort of be a light unto the world in a very, again, sort of self-important inflated kind of way. Um, in terms of what the general public then feels back about that, actually one of the things on my to-do list for next week is to go and see whether there are any um, mentions of medical professionals, of doctors, of allied 
physicians and surgeons and whatnot in the um, newspaper record because a lot of those are searchable and should be a fairly straightforward look into things. Um, because there's no way that this is an entirely one-sided debate. Clearly, if doctors are speaking out as loudly and as frequently as they are, there's going to be another side of the equation, and that's something that I really want to, to look into. So. Other questions? Yeah, David. Yeah, this is for uh, uh, Jeff. You were talking uh, uh, about sort of testimony as, uh, you know, how do you read it? Are you reading against the grain? Are you taking their the agency and testimony or not? One of the first questions that, that you have to ask, which I'm sure you know, but, but you didn't explain, is the, the nuts and bolts question of the sort of the actual conditions of what ends up on your printed page that you're studying and how it got there. So are we talking about oral testimony that's taken down by legal stenographers as it's been given orally? Are we talking about depositions that are prepared by attorneys? Uh, or are we talking about depositions sort of prepared with the help of kind of paralegal ad hoc scribes, which happens in, in, in a lot of countries? And what does that process of the generation of this testimony say about how you read it and how much massaging of the narrative to uh, in accordance with certain legal knowledge. You know, in some cases you get really unmitigated uh, or unmediated testimony. In other cases you get very mediated testimony mediated by a legal strategy. And a lot depends on, on what the, the actual process of the giving of the testimony is. Mm -hmm. That's a great question, actually. And um, I guess I'll start by just prefacing that my work um, unfortunately, I'm a bit of a novice when it comes to um, you know, legal history. Um, it's not really my focus, but um, it's certainly something with this chapter that needs to be addressed a bit more fully, I think. And um, certainly the manner in which these testimonies get put on paper um, is fairly important, especially because um, the type of sort of colonial courts that are, that are sort of being held in this particular area in the interior, I mean, there is a great quote I had to cut out um, but it basically talks about, um, it explains this gradualness and how it's, it's okay for these things to continue on into the interior because the way in which legislation works is that it will, it will soon will start applying the same legislation as we have in the south into the north. So I mean, there's this sort of ambiguity in terms of how um, hard and fast you want to hold up these certain types of ordinances. And um, in other parts of my thesis, I talk about how um, administrators lament over the fact that they can see women in chains and in leg irons and getting logged, but quote, you know, there's nothing we can do here because in other districts, this would be an infringement upon the ordinance, but here it's just everyday stuff. And so there's a certain sort of um, gray area here in terms of that, but then in this particular case as well, because these girls have been living in Asante for a decade, um, they were having court translators. And so that's a huge part of, of how this um, transcript before it even gets in, on paper is already contextualized and recontextualized in ways that I can't seem to pin down. And I don't try to in this paper because it's far too difficult um, to even distinguish what was really actually happening in terms of um, what these girls were if you want to put them into a category of slave, domestic slave, um, you know, pawn, whatnot. Um, it's incredibly difficult because of this intellectualization that's happening during the process and then being put on paper. Who was the clerk who was, you know, doing the transcription? That's something I don't know and that's something that is, um, you know, is something very important in order to include. So there are too many question marks, I think, unfortunately, but um, for most uh, cases like this or archives like this, that, that's what intrigues me, is that I can't answer all these questions. But, um, but it's something certainly to, to spend a section flushing out a bit more, I think, in the chapter. Thank you. I have a question for Jess, which, um, well, it's not so much a question, it's, uh, I'm just curious about my thing that um, you mentioned um, tribal markings that distinguish between free and unfree labor. I'm just curious about what um, those markings were. Um, and another is just to comment, and you can talk about it as a brand, but I'm just wondering about the implications of the ideas of differences in ethnicity that would make a northern, northern person, a foreigner, 
um, the implications of that and the sort of labor relations um, in the colonial, colonial period uh, and how they play out in the post-colonial period in, with the nation states. Um, I'm, I mean, this is, I know it's outside of the No, I get what you're getting at. Project. Yeah. Um, the, it's outside of the time period you study. It's just uh, something I'm interested in uh, studying now, and so it's just, I felt there was a parallel in your, in your description. And that's one of the things I try to do, and I think um, um, I'm really happy that you brought it up because it gives me an opportunity to talk a bit more about what Ishita brought up as well, about how it fits into the larger thesis because these sort of ideas of um, northerners being primitive and backward, and obviously tribal markings being an outwardly sort of visual marker for that, um, become sort of repackaged post-independence as well. So um, that doesn't necessarily die out. It just kind of works its way in insidious ways into this nationalist sort of rhetoric. So we are one nation. Oh, but you need to stop being backward here. So let's launch some campaigns and crash campaigns against nudity and scarification and all the things that make Ghana as a whole look backward. And so to tie in a little bit what I should ask before and I, and I dodged and I'm sorry because I didn't have a pen to remember, the Anglo-French border um, becomes important too in the post-independence, even more important because during the part of my thesis that talks about the, um, uh, the colonial period, um, we're looking at administrators sort of coupling their sort of lament that they can't do anything with a, oh, well, it's foreigners coming in to the Gold Coast that are bringing these customs. So Busanga peoples that are um, sort of categorized or taxonomized as from French territory are living in large populations in the Gold Coast, but all of a sudden it becomes, well, you know, we can't close the borders and labor migration. So we'll just say this is a foreigner practice, and then therefore we don't need to legislate. And that filters in into the post-independent period. So there's a heyday of let's legislate against all of these things. Oh, wait a second, what's that going to do to borders and the labor that's still coming in from these borders? So political economy trumps all, all of this, really. And tribal markings um, can take different forms. The, what I would say, uh, the only purposeful sort of response that I could give to that is that um, many administrators took too literal of, um, of an attitude towards what tribal marks said about a particular ethnicity or, or um, state of belonging. So there's one section that I have in my thesis that talks about how um, one of the um, administrators is saying that these tribal markings are becoming more about beauty and not about ethnicity. And so there are some that are getting it that it's not about tribal categories, clean and static, but on the whole, it's used to sort of categorize and taxonomize. So, but as time goes on, it, I mean, even now if you go to Baku, I mean, some people will say that there are Mempuzi tri tribal marks and Erkusadi tribal marks, but that's filtering through the, the post-conflict there. In reality, some of the markings may be completely, you know, overlapping. <laughs> Thank you, though. <laughs> I think for maybe one more. not, then let's thank our two uh, speakers.